tell you a little bit about the story of uh, rehabilitation, how rehabilitation came into, the way we talk about the rehabilitation, halfway houses, they were not there earlier. Uh, so I'll first, uh, maybe about 15, 20 minutes, I'll talk to you about uh, the scenario of mental health care all over the world and in India in the 60s and 70s. That is when the idea of starting a non-governmental organization in the field of mental health came up in India. Medical Partial Association was the first uh, organization. In fact, my association uh, with MPA uh, is from 1971, even before it was registered as an organization. Uh, you know, because I delivered a lecture for a, a group of suicide prevention volunteers in Bowring and Lady Crescent Hospital in 1971. And uh, from the time the halfway home came up, I've been in some way or the other associated. So it's a very, very, uh, you know, nostalgic, passionate moment for me that we are celebrating 50 years. And, uh, you know, the MPA very kindly asked me to deliver this first lecture. So what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about the mental health care across the globe and in India during the 1960s and 70s, you know, to give you the background when these ideas came up. And then the second part of the lecture, I'll tell you about the beginnings of Medical Partial Association, not so much about the work it has done in the past two, three decades, but in the 70s and 80s, what it did, because there were not so many NGOs in the country. Today, there are, of course, any number of uh, uh, medical uh, non-governmental organizations in the field of mental health. You know, one of the more recent one is the, uh, I think, Live, Love, Laugh Foundation started by Deepika Padukone. Today, it is, of course, not any big deal to start a, a NGO in the field of mental health. But in the 70s, when NGO, MPA was started, it was not so. And uh, tracing the history, I was myself curious, how did this organization choose the name of Medico Partial Association. Medico Partial Association is not the name that you would find, uh, you know, linked to a rehabilitation center uh, or an NGO. How did an NGO started in the cathedral? Mr. Samuel, our secretary, mentioned during the welcome that it started in St. Mark's Cathedral. You know, usually organizations which start in a church or a cathedral will remain that kind of an organization. How did it become a secular organization? And how and why did the founders think of starting a halfway home? This was the first halfway home in the country. Uh, you know, it was opened in 1976. So these are the things that I would like to tell you in this lecture. Uh, of course, when I, uh, you know, was planning to talk about this, my own good friend and our vice president asked me, you know, talking about history is boring. Who will be interested? Uh, I believe in history because I, I have quoted here uh, George Santayana, who is a, a, a Spanish philosopher, who said that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Many others have said it in different ways, including Winston Churchill, etc. But I think, uh, you know, when you are starting a year-long series of activities to celebrate the Golden Jubilee, uh, I thought it is most fitting to look back and see how all this came about. And then we can talk about the present and the future. So that is why I chose to talk about history rather than anything else. It is very dry. Not many people are interested in history. But I firmly believe that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And uh, in the last two, three days, I'm sure people who are following the world events would agree with what uh, George and Diana said. I mean, uh, you know, if uh, people are watching on the TV, the fall of, or the impending fall of Kiev, you know, you might be reminded of the, the Second World War days. Now, uh, the talking about the uh, scenario all over the world during the, uh, you know, the last, not last 50 years, the first half of the last century, uh, that is uh, from 1900 till about 1950s and 60s. There are four or five main events. I'll tell you a little bit about each of these. First is the rise of the mental hospital, the fall of the mental hospital, the rise and fall of the asylum. Uh, I would be grateful if all people could uh, mute their audio, please.
uh, rise and follow the asylums in the 90s. Dr. Mohan, you need to unmute. Okay. Uh, what happened was, as the host unmuted everybody, I also got unmuted. Now I have, you know, I have, uh, I think uh, you can hear me now. Second is the discovery of the first ever medication to treat people with mental illness and that occurred. Now looking back, it, uh, one might be surprised that it occurred only as recently as 60 or 70 years ago in 1952. Following which uh, there was this great, uh, you know, revolutionary moment called the deinstitutionalization. Large number of people got discharged from mental hospitals. Where would they go? Many of them had families, many didn't have families. And that is how the concept of alternative to hospitalization, non-hospital residential rehabilitation came up. Uh, there was, of course, the growth of community mental health centers all over the world. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about each of this. I'm just uh, struggling to, ah. Okay, steady growth of the asylums in developing countries. Why did Western societies invest in asylums? You know, I told you it uh, began in the 19th century and the second half of the 20th century. That was a period when rapid urbanization, rapid uh, industrialization was occurring all over the Western world. Society needed to isolate the deviant and people with deviant and disturbing behavior. Uh, you know, at that time, there was no effective treatment. It was only in 1952, chlorpromazine was discovered. So one of the reasons why mental hospitals steadily grew, of course, there were good places to begin with. In fact, uh, they were chosen, the location of the mental hospitals were ideal. The ones that I have visited, uh, you know, in fact, uh, the ones which are still there in Perth are all by the side of a river or at an elevated place with the beautiful views. This is so most of the mental hospitals in UK and USA, et cetera. Uh, so there was a steady increase of numbers of hospitals as well as number of people in the hospitals. Uh, to just give you a statistics in 1955, that is when the deinstitutionalization movement started, there were 352 state and country hospitals in the United States with the total number of, you know, over a half million people who were in patients. But this growth started slowly declining. The fall of the asylums began, uh, you know, from the 20th century. It uh, went on from the early 1900s till the 1955, and after that, asylums were being closed down. Uh, why did uh, this occur? Because the hospitals had ever-increasing admissions, because people with the deviant behavior had to be locked up. Uh, ultimately, it resulted in overcrowding. These were true of our Indian mental hospitals too. And uh, after the two great wars of the last century, the funding for mental, mental hospitals, et cetera, came down because of other needs. And consequently, the living conditions in mental hospitals uh, rapidly declined. I mean, this is a picture of one of the very famous uh, high security hospital. This is not an old picture. This is, uh, you know, about three years back, the ITV uh, channel in UK showed uh, about the Broadmoor High Security Hospital. Uh, you know, people uh, have heard about this hospital through novels and movies and all that, about very dangerous mentally ill people, etc. Uh, so the ITV showed a program on this hospital. This is the Broadmoor high security hospital, you see the wall, it's more like a jail. Maybe it's worse than a jail. Jails are perhaps much better these days. This is the back of the hospital because the high wall was not only in the front, but everywhere around. This is one of the very old hospitals in Washington, DC, the St. Elizabeth Psychiatric Hospital. This is not a more recent picture. This is the early part of the uh, 1900s. Many of the old mental hospitals in the United States have either been converted or uh, converted to other things or sold, uh, demolished and real estate sold, etc., etc. We have such stories in India also. I'll come to that a little later on. This is our own. This is a more recent picture. This is a picture which I have not taken, but I've taken from the uh, Times of India uh, three years ago, four years ago. And uh, I think one of the inmates uh, injured 
crashed up another inmate and there was a news item. I don't remember whether that other patient died, but these are things which have occurred in all mental hospitals. Uh, this is the famous Yerwada Mental Hospital in Pune. This is the front gate. Uh, it is not very surprising that the Yerwada Mental Hospital is uh, close to the Yerwada Jail. Yerwada Jail is famous because our own uh, father of the nation was locked up in that place. So mental hospitals and jails were very similar. And this is uh, a recent picture of the Pune Yerwada mental, uh, uh, mental Hospital. This is just to say that mental hospitals were not very good cases. Uh, I'm trying to move my, ah, oh, yes. So there was this growing professional and public concern that asylums were unhealthy places, not therapeutic institutions. But with all these things didn't change. Things began changing because of three or four main events. First of them is, you know, a patient, uh, Clifford Beers. He was in an American mental hospital, I think in Cincinnati, for about three years, from 1900 till 1903, 1904. By our current assessment, he would have suffered from bipolar affective disorder. We now know a lot more about his illness. But he also had delusions, hallucinations. He was psychotic. He was initially admitted for uh, a suicide attempt. And he, uh, and then later he became well, of course, due to the mercy of people in the hospital, because those days, if you got admitted, you rarely got discharged. He got out and he wrote a book, which is called A Mind That Found Itself. It was published in 1908. It's an autobiographical account of the mental hospitalization and all the abuses that he suffered. This book is now freely available. Of course, if you were to buy a hard copy, it might cost about uh, uh, 9,000 rupees if you buy it from Amazon in India, but you don't have to buy it. Anybody who is interested in reading this, it's freely available online. I can give you the link for this. And I think anybody who is interested in the field of mental health, want all students of psychiatry, social work, et cetera, et cetera, should read this book all volunteers, all uh, other people who help in, you know, rehabilitation centers such as MPA should read this book. I had the privilege of reading this because the Nimans Library had a copy. I don't know whether the copy is there now. It was reprinted several times. A mind fo that found itself, it's influenced me tremendously about, uh, you know, this is a more recent edition. It's available even now. Uh, uh, I would like to quote some of the things that Clifford Beers, so, uh, Beers wrote, and I think this is very relevant. Most sane people think that no insane person can reason logically, but this is not so. You may or may not agree with me, you may not agree with Clifford Beers, but this is what he wrote. He went on to start the National Committee on Mental Hygiene, which is still uh, very active in the United States. In fact, People who joined with him to start the National Committee of Mental Hygiene were people like Adolf Mayer, who later became the president of the American Psychiatric Association. It's a mentally ill person who was in an American mental hospital for more than three or four years. He wrote a book, and in 1909, he started this committee, National Committee of Mental Health, Mental Hygiene. Uh, he wrote, when the National Committee was organized in 1909, its chief concern was to humanize the care of the insane, to eradicate the abuses, brutalities, and neglect from which the mentally sick have traditionally suffered. Uh, of course, one wonders whether these have all been cleared of all the mental hospitals all over the world. Now, uh, so that was Clifford Beers. Another major influence on mental hospital reforms in the first half of the last century uh, is, I don't know whether anybody would recognize, I'm sure many in the audience would recognize this. This is uh, Jack Nicholson, uh, you know, arguing with the nurse, the head nurse, the matron of the mental hospital in Oregon that he was admitted. Uh, you know, this had a tremendous influence later on. Uh, this is, uh, of course, people who watch uh, movies would know this is Jack Nicholson. Uh, there was this famous book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, which was written by a person by name Ken Casey. Uh, uh, 
the, the book, the novel, the story is about an Oregon mental hospital. Maybe the, although the book was published in 1962, uh, it was written uh, uh, about the situation in the Oregon mental hospitals, perhaps in the 1930s, 40s. Uh, Casey had earlier worked as a night staff in a veteran hospital, veteran hospital, veterans hospital, which looked after mentally ill people. And he knew, and uh, and Casey also believed that a lot of these people are not really insane. If they are insane, we are more insane than them. And the novel was adapted into a play and later a movie. The novel, this was Ken Casey's first book. He, he is famous for other things because he uh, volunteered as a, uh, uh, research, for researchers on LSD and hallucinogens, he volunteered and he had a lot of experience and he has written many other things. But in this case, his first novel became overnight a bestseller. In fact, the Time magazine says that this is one of the best uh, 100 books of the last 100, last 200 years. And it was uh, converted into a play and later into a movie. And when it was made into a movie, some of us uh, must have watched it in the 70s. Uh, I watched it uh, soon after finishing DPM from the man's. It came out in 1975, I think. What is this movie known for? Besides uh, contributing to mental health reforms all over the world. Making, uh, can you please, can you please mute, please? Can you please? Okay. It's come on, you need to unmute. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, uh this is uh, also known for a number of other things because it is not only initiating mental hospital reforms, creating, you know, anti-stigma campaigns, etc. Lots of things it did. But it's one of the only three moves in the 91st uh, year's history of Oscars, which won all the all the five. It's called the big five. If a movie wins the best picture, best actor, best actress, best director, and best screenplay, then these are the big five awards. And in the history of Oscars, there have been only three movies which won this. Uh, in the 1930s, a movie called It Happened One Night, not many people may know that. Then in 1975, One Flew on Cuckoo's Nest. And then in 1991, another movie which many of you may know, The Silence of the Lambs, where it is not about a mental patient, but it's a brilliant forensic psychiatrist. I'm sure many of you have seen that also. These are the only three movies which have won the big five in the Oscar uh, awards. Okay. Now, so I talked about uh, Clifford Beers, his contribution, the mind that found itself. And I talked about, uh, you know, the one flew over the cuckoo's nest, the play, the book, the play, and then the movie. And now this is the picture of Irving Goffman. And now he's an academician, he's a sociologist. He studied, you know, the problems in institutions such as mental hospitals. He wrote a very famous book, which is again worth reading, very easily available. It's called Asylums. Essays on the social situation of mental patients and other inmates. Irving Goffman, you know, yeah. carried out, uh, uh, he has also written about stigma about mental disorders, so I'll not go into the details. Now, but all these would not have uh, resulted in rehabilitation programs of the kind that we are currently involved in the community mental health, the emptying of mental hospitals, but for the serendipitous discovery of the first effective medication used to treat mentally ill. This was in 1952. Uh, the medically trained people in the audience would know that I'm referring to chlorpromazin. It is read to widespread introduction of chlorpromazin in the developed world. And that resulted in a movement which is referred to as the deinstitutionalization movement. Uh, de what is a deinstitutionalization? It is moving severely mentally ill people out of large institutions such as mental hospitals and shifting their care and support to community-based settings. Initially, it was hoped that they could be treated in their own homes, looked after in their own homes, but various other kinds of 
institutions, smaller institutions had to be built up for looking after these people. And then you close down either the full hospital or the uh, part of the hospital. So just to give you again some a feel of numbers, there was widespread downsizing and closure of asylums all over the developed world began from 1955. In the developing world, it is still taking place. Uh, it is uh, in its infancy in many countries. I'll show you some slides on that. Downsizing and closure of asylums occurred at varying pace in different countries because of political, socioeconomic reasons, etc. Just to give the example of United States, the number of severely mentally in patients in mental hospitals, I showed you in a slide earlier that it was more than half a million in 1955. It came down to 71,000, around 71,000 by the 1900s. Uh, of course, you should also take into consideration the US population in 1955 was 164 million and 90, 1994 it's 260 million. So a large number of people are tre being treated in treated as well as looked after in the community. But the process in the United States subsequently was uh, quickened by another event which occurred. And uh, again, I'm sure people who are familiar with history would uh, recognize this handsome, not so very old uh, man signing a document with a lot of very, very important looking people standing behind. This is John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States, signing the Community Mental Health Act in 1963. President Kennedy is called for the closure of large institutions at their community and their replacement by home and community care services in 1961 was a major trigger for this. And this was because of the Community Mental Health Act enacted in 1963. And the other historical importance for people who are interested in history is that you might know that, you might remember that Kennedy was assassinated in November of 1963. This, uh, they say, is one of the last pieces of paper signed by President Kennedy, just three weeks before his assassination. Uh, this paved the way for creation of community mental health. In fact, this document, Action for Mental Health, he talked about a new deal for mental health. It was thought that uh, there will not be any more institutionalized management for patients with mental, mental health problems. So that is how non-hospital community residential facilities, such as halfway homes, hostels, etc., came up. Today, there are various forms of supported accommodation in the community. There are, in Western countries, mental health is delivered through community mental health teams, various forms of case management. I will not go into the details of all. Another important factor, uh, this is Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of the then president, in the, uh, you know, the president of the United States, uh, Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, during the Second World War, he was a famous president. But his wife, Eleanor, who was also a kind of a, little bit of a politician. Uh, this is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was signed and passed in 1948 or so. Uh, but the point I want to tell you here is that the principles for the protection of persons with mental illness and the improvement of mental health care was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly only in 1991. So the rights of the mentally ill, so I told you about harms which have occurred to the mentally ill people being locked up, told you about, you know, I mean, I didn't tell you the, for those of you know, who don't know, who have not watched uh, uh, the story uh, of one flu or the closeness, this chap probably by our current diagnostic terms may have qualified for, you know, the person, uh, uh, the character enacted by uh, uh, Jack Nicholson, he may have had a personality disorder, but because he was, so normal by the mental hospital standards and he rebelled against the nurse. He was given electric shocks and ultimately lobotomized. This was not very unusual. So what I'm saying is, in spite of all the things which occurred in mental hospitals, etc., the principles for the protection of persons with mental illness and the improvement of mental health care was passed even by the United Nations only in 1991. Now, this was what was occurring globally. Mental health care in India during 60s and 70s were not very different. 
if at all anything, several steps behind. We had the same kind of mental hospitals. We know of the Kilpok Mental Hospital. We know of the Bangalore Mental Hospital, which now is Nimhan's. You know, the Bangalore Mental Hospital was comparatively much better. Karwada, Tane, everywhere. There were 37. Most of the care were in the mental hospitals in the country. Traditional and alternative and faith healing was widely prevalent. Removal of spirits, even now it is there, but it is probably occurring to a much lesser extent. There were no psychiatry units in general hospitals. They came up only in maybe slowly during the 70s and later in the 80s. No non-government organization in the field of mental health. Today there are hundreds. And that is why I like to highlight the period when a group of people thought about starting the Medical Pastoral Association. I'll come to that. Occupational therapy or rehabilitation, anything to be referred to as rehabilitation occurred in occupational therapy units in some of the mental hospitals, like the mental hospital in Ranchi. The European mental hospital in Ranchi had a fairly uh, you know, commendable rehabilitation program. And what was a rehabilitation program? You made the patients do day-to-day -day work in the hospital, cleaning, gardening, kitchen work, distribution of work. In fact, when I joined for my TPM, and I'm sure Dr. Kalyan Sundaram would remember, it was a comparatively better patients who carried food from ward to ward, helped in serving them. So cleaning, gardening, kitchen work, distribution of food, and they never got paid for it. That's a different matter. And they, of course, participated in recreational activities, celebrated festivals, music in the ward, etc. That was all the rehabilitation. So now I'll come to Medical Partial Association. And uh, I believe that it is very important. It is in the background of all these that the Medical Partial Association came up from the middle of 1960s and registered as the first NGO in the country in uh, 1972. As Mr. Samuel referred to in his uh, uh, welcome address, this is the famous St. Mark's Cathedral, built in 1908, you know, more than 200 years old. This is a current picture. It's a very, very majestic uh, church cathedral at one end of the Mahatma Gandhi Road in Bangalore. Very important. Lots of things started. But how did they start? How did they even think of mental health of people, uh, which ultimately resulted in an organization, suicide prevention programs, Alcoholics Anonymous programs, half a home, etc. Uh, uh, I would mention, when you trace history, uh, there is always this question, do you talk of events? Do you talk of, uh, uh, you know, uh, individuals? I believe that individuals have a great role. If somebody who writes the history of the last one or two weeks, you know, we don't know how the war is going to shape up, whether uh, there will be problem in Europe, there are lots of fears, but, one of the characters who would be talked about would be Vladimir Putin. Uh, rightly or wrongly, that's how history is recorded, history of us. So that is one of the reasons why I chose to mention several people, because we, they are all uh, uh, people who have contributed to the idea of medical bachelorship. Reverend Harry Daniel was the first Indian presbyter of the St. Mark's Cathedral. Till then, although India became independent in 1947, British went, the, the colonization stopped, at least in the church. Till 1961, it were, uh, you know, a priest from the church, uh, Anglican church, who were the presbyters. And the first Indian presbyter of the church was Harry Daniel, who took charge of the cathedral in 1961. And one of the things he initiated was an urban industrial mission project. Bangalore was, you know, from its uh, very, uh, very lazy, uh, uh, pensioners paradise kind of, uh, uh, you know, very cool climate, nice for everybody to live, li less number of population, three or four months you have to wear a sweater around, you know, starting from November till February. But Bangalore was slowly beginning to get industrialized, urbanized, a lot of people from other states. That is a process which is still occurring, but it was occurring at that time. You know, the public, great public sector investment occurred Companies such as the Hindustan Aeronautics, Hindustan Machine Tools, Indian Telephone Industries, the Bharat Earth Movers, Bharat Electronics, all of them were started here. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, why did the first and second governments of India under Jawaharlal Nehru think of investing all this in uh, Bangalore? Because 
Karnataka was always thought of as a very polar. People were polite. The labor cost was better. There was no history of labor problem. That's another historical event. But Bangalore was rapidly urbanized. Even when the private sector, they thought of big, uh, big ticket industry sector, such as the MICO, it was established in Bangalore. A lot of people were coming in for education, vastly increasing urban population. Today, of course, Bangalore is known as the, uh, uh, you know, the capital of the computer industry. Uh, the, a lot of people from the same thing is actually. Anyway, going back to the 60s, the industrial team service at St. Mark's invited a gentleman, gentleman by name Paul Sroman, who passed away a couple of years ago, uh, uh, well into his 90s, uh, and his wife. Along with him came his wife, Dr. Joyce Roman, who is the founder of Medical Park. She is not a psychiatrist. She is not a mental health person. She is a doctor, medical doctor, trained in CMC Vellur. And then she got a diploma of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists in London. She came with her husband and joined him in Bangalore. This is their picture. Both are no more. Joyce died uh, uh, three years ago, four years ago, and uh, one or two years after that, Paul died. Uh, but again, uh, that is all good. Industrial uh, uh, work and uh, Harry Daniel thought that, uh, you know, you need to do something. But the Medical Parcel Association would not have come up for, but for this gentleman, the doctor, Dr. Basil Hetzel. He gave a talk at the cathedral. But those days, and even probably now, they invite people to come and give talks uh, to the parishioners. I know our moderator, Dr. Matthew Vergis, had shown a talk in St. Mark's uh, recently, one or two months ago. So Dr. Basil Hetzel had gone there. He's from Adelaide. Uh, he gave a talk to the parish, perhaps on a Sunday after service. And Dr. Hetzel is somebody who believed in the biopsychosocial causation of not just mental disorders, but all disorders. He thought that every illness had a biological component, psychological component, social component, etc. Uh, so he talked about... Uh, uh, let me tell you a little more about uh, this person. Uh, he was in Adelaide. He was a physician by training. He believed that clinical practice, teaching, research, in all these, if you are a doctor and practicing, you should have a holistic approach. You should treat the whole person, not just his illness. He spoke at the cathedral of medical pastoral teamwork. He said that such things occurred here and there in Australia. He reported that doctor clergy groups had been meeting in Australia for some years. Of course, chaplains visiting hospitals there in, uh, uh, you know, many parts of the world, but he talked about it. He went, now, a little bit more about Basil Hetzel, because he's one of the best known uh, Australian physicians. Uh, he went on to become one of Australia's greatest medical pioneers, he studied the role of severe iodine deficiency in goiter and brain damage. Uh, so his, based on his work now, there is iodization of salt all over the world. Cretinism and iodine deficiency problems are not there. Otherwise, cretinism led to mental retardation and all that. So he is one of those pioneers. There are not many, I mean, Australia is a very good country, but there are not many people who have contributed to global medicine. Even the number of uh, people who have won uh, a Nobel Prize uh, in medicine and physiology is just a handful. I have had the privilege of working with one of them in Fremantle in the University of Western Australia. I'm referring to Barry uh, Marshall, who uh, discovered that helicobacter is the cause for peptic ulcer. And his famous experiment, where he drank in a beaker of water, helicobacter developed peptic ulcer and demonstrated it. He won Nobel Prize in 19, uh, 2004 or something like that. He, that occurred in the Fremantle Hospital, where I'm working now in the psychiatry department. So Basil Hetzel is somebody who introduced to the parishioners the idea of doctor clergy work, medical pastoral work. Etc. This is a picture of uh, Hetzel working with iodine deficiency kids as well as adults. In, uh, he worked in Papua New Guinea. 
Java, etc. The doctor clergy group at St. Mark's, members of this group, besides doctors and clergy, were lay members, interested people of the cathedral, and members of various parishes in fact. The group was concerned about emotional and social well-being of individuals, as well as the society at large in Bangalore. Experts were invited to give talks on psychosocial aspects of health and disease. Group member, members regularly visited CSI, St. Martha's Hospital, to meet with needy patients, you know, like chaplaincy work. Another person who influenced the growth of this doctor clergy group is Dr. Frank Lake, he was a trained psychiatrist. He was then the superintendent of CMC Hospital, Velour, one of the pioneers of pastoral counseling. Uh, uh, he was the uh, president then of the uh, pastoral theological, uh, pastoral theology association. Dr. Lake was invited by the Synod of Church of South India to Bangalore to provide training and counseling to clergy. And uh, uh, he chose a group of 12 people to give a one week long workshop on this, you know, psychosocial counseling and, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing things to the uh, whole, wholeness of man, the holistic kind of thing. And two people who attended, who were chosen to attend uh, that workshop were Joyce Romani uh, and Dr. Air Commodore Chak. It is interesting that Frank Lake himself was a parasitologist. He came, uh, you know, to do tropical medicine. He, he was working in CMC Velour, and then uh, they didn't have a psychiatry unit. They didn't have a psychiatrist. This is the late 40s, early 50s. They asked Frank Lake to go back to England, get trained in psychiatry, and come back. So he started the psychiatry department there. Uh, it is around that time that he came. No, late 50s that he came. 50s, early 60s, he came to Velour to give this talk. This is Joyce Romani. And this is Ekamro Chako, both of whom had, you know, till Siromani left Bangalore to Calcutta, she started Paripurnada there, but then she returned to Madras. But Ekamro Chako, till his death, he had something or the other to do with the Medical Pastoral Association. He and his wife, Dorian Chako, used to come and teach yoga to our residents uh, as long as they were there. Okay. Lake's group, most of the members who attended the workshop met as a group in the house of Joyce Roman. They were referred to as Lake's group. The experience of this group managing people with emotional disturbances was a forerunner to starting of the Medical Pastoral Association. So the Dr. Clergy group, the Medical Pastoral Association. So that's fine. But how did the, this uh, cathedral, uh, you know, church uh, originated association become a secular organization? They widened their scope of his activities and services. They opened its membership as well as services to people of all faith. And what I have learned from Dr. Joyce Romani is that this was on the advice of Dr. Aram Verma, who was a then director of All India Institute of Mental Health, it was, which is now called NIMHANS. Verma was a director. He, he is very well known, although he was a neurosurgeon. He was interested in public health. He was, uh, you know, from the royal family of Kerala. Uh, he retired as the director of Nimans. He advised Joyce Romani that, uh, you know, while this kind of cathedral uh, founded organizations have a role to play, but secular organizations, especially in the field of mental health, have much more to do. He said, your survey should go to all people and you should uh, invite all members. That's how. Uh, organization which took its roots in a cathedral became a secular organization. There were also other people. I'll tell you one more name in that connection. Medical Pastoral Association was conceived and evolved from the doctor clergy group. Joyce Romani took the initiative of starting the association as its founding secretary. The association was formed as a secular autonomous body, non-governmental organization, the first of its kind. This is 1967. They wanted to see the viability of the organization, registered only in 1972. The first president was Dr. Benjamin Isaac, one of the only, perhaps, cardiothoracic surgeon and medical superintendent of the CSI hospital in Bangalore. He was an active member uh, of the Dr. Clergy Group. He was a member of the cathedral. He was a founding president. But another person who contributed immensely 
to the growth, the creation of this association is Dr. S. S. Jera. Again, one of the very few psychiatrists in private practice at that time. Uh, he started the Bangalore Nursing Home. He was trained in Canada, USA, Scotland, he also in India at uh, you know the All India Institute of Mental Health, the former name of the man's. Uh, he associated with Medical Pastoral Association very actively. He was its vice president from 73 to 78 and president from 1978 to 83. He was also the honorary psychiatrist of the halfway home when it started. He passed away in 2014. He was also a president, past president of the Indian Psychiatric Society. It's uh, good to remember that more recently, our current vice president, Dr. Ajit Bide, is also a past president of the Indian Psychiatric Society. So the Medical Bachelor Association was inaugurated in 67 at the St. Mark's Parish Hall by the uh, Right Reverend Norman Sargent, who was a bishop here. He was the second bishop of the Church of South India Diocese of Mysore. The association was registered under Mysore Societies uh, Act in 1972 on 3rd of August 1972. Uh, so we thought that we will begin our Golden Jubilee observation six months before, and that's how on 26th of February, we have this inaugural program and the first of the 12 lectures that we are planning to have. During the early years, the association continued to operate from the home of Joyce and Paul Siromani in St. Mark's. This is a certificate of registration. The address given is, uh, you know, one Mahatma Gandhi Road, St. Mark's Cathedral. It is not the cathedral, but the, in the campus was the quarters of uh, Joyce Romani, and that is the address given. This is what uh, Ajit began with, our logo, hope, concern, sharing, and guidance. Now, how did uh, they think of starting a half a home? I mean, you are doing lots of things, suicide prevention, social well-being, etc. The, the story is that of a girl named Teresa, a 21-year-old girl from Kerala with somebody's help. She went to Netherlands. She trained as a nurse, but she had even got a job after her training, but she had a mental breakdown, which was diagnosed as schizophrenia, and she returned to India. So when people came from overseas, they were admitted to the mental hospital in Bangalore, the All India Institute of Mental Health. Uh, after a period of treatment there, uh, she got discharged. Following discharge from the man's, she was to go and join her parents in Kerala, older parents. But then it was found that uh, it was difficult. See, the hospital did not need to keep her anymore because her active, positive symptoms, etc., came down. But the parents found it extremely difficult to keep her at home because she had not become completely well and they didn't know how to manage it. That is when somebody uh, uh, a well-wisher of the family contacted Joyce Romani, asking for assistance to find a place for Teresa to recoup. You know, a place to stay for maybe three weeks, four weeks, till the parents can take her back. He looked for various places, didn't find. Ultimately, with the you know, consent of her husband, the children were very young at that time, she decided to take Teresa to her home and look, af look after her for some time. And then she learned a lot. She has written about it. She has even written and published, well, what do you do? do? She was not a psychiatrist. She was not a trained counselor. She was a gynecologist, obstetrician and gynecologist. But this experience gave her the idea that if there is Teresa who requires this, there's supposed to be many other people who require this kind of help. And that is how the idea of Half a Home in Bangalore was mooted by Joy. She got, got everybody in her group enthused. And that's how we, the idea came up. But then ideas, you know, to implement that and put into practice, you need so many things. So the halfway home was planned to provide persons discharged from standalone psychiatric centers uh, a period of stay in a therapeutic environment in a homely place before returning to their own homes. So this is a very Indian kind of halfway home. Of course, we had at that time similar homes were coming up in. Uh, Western countries, I trace the history of, you know, the discovery of chlorpromazin, the deinstitutionalization, etc., the non-hospital residential rehabilitation uh, centers. But this was India's own 
first half a home. It was felt that such a home would help them to integrate better with their families or places of work or study, etc. But then this idea is good, but how do you operationalize? Uh, and that is a story of how she went around, how the Joyce Romani went around, got a piece of land, got donations from various places, both from within and outside the country. And that's how the half a home was developed. The first building was put up, uh, the office block in 1975. The land was given, it was an abandoned Muslim uh, cemetery under the Bangalore City Corporation. The Joyce was able to convince the then uh, administrator, Mr. Lakshman Rao. Lakshman Rao is credited for various things, he is no more. He is somebody who, you know, added to the, uh, you know, planning of the city. Bangalore is still considered as one of the better cities in India. Uh, Lakshman Rao was, uh, is credited with lots of things. And he gave this land on lease for 30 years, 1975 to 2005. And that is where the half a home was. This is a picture of Lakshman Rao a few years before he died. This is when I have the foundation stone was uh, laid. People uh, who are familiar with some of the characters that I refer to will recognize Dr. S.S. Jairam, Dr. Aram Verma, Dr. P. Kodendram, who used to be a faculty in the Department of uh, and, uh, Psychology in Mans. And of course, there's the Archbishop, there is this, you know, the bald-headed short man with the shirt is Dr. Benjamin Isaac. And the person who laid the foundation stone was the Chief Secretary of Karnataka, Mr. G.V.K. Rao. Both Mr. G.V.K. Rao and Lakshman Rao are there. The Bishop Norman Sargent is there. This is a foundation loan stay. This is the first building where the first residents were kept. Uh, you know, the, uh, this is now being used as the administrative block. And uh, I'm now going to wind up uh, by saying what all happened. But this is the story of how this is the half a home. Uh, four men, all discharged from the man's two with primary alcohol related problems. And the other two with mental illness were admitted to the first constructed building, which was the administrative block. This building became the administrative block after completion of the half a home building. So the half a home was established in 76, 18 residents, nine women and nine men. This is how the half a home looks now. Then of course, we have started other things in the campus. We still can have other facilities. There is enough land. In 2005, when the lease ended, the then committee decided to buy the land by paying a huge amount. So these are some of the milestones. The second building I showed is a quarter way home, which is called Navjeevan. It was conceptualized. Half a home is for people who just got out of the hospital, not as ready to go home. The quarter way home is while they are getting rehabilitated, they are getting better to, you know, go back to their college or school or workplace, but still, you know, the home is far away. So it's like a hostel, it's a quarter way home. These clear distinctions have sort of got a little blurred because of various things which are occurring in the Indian society, the rapidly changing families, the breakdown of the joint families, etc. I'll not go into the details of all that. The many other things which uh, the Medical Bachelor Association did, uh, Sahai, the Suicide Prevention Helpline, was referred to by our president, Dr. Joseph Todd. And 2006, we were able to, we were supposed to pay huge amounts if we had to continue lease. They said there's no lease, but you can pay a rent to the corporation at the market rate. And the committee decided to buy the lease land and now the land is owned by. This is the Sahai. Now I lent now, several highly motivated, committed, innovative and imaginative people supported and worked for MBA during the past 15 years. Many are continuing to work in various capacities such as office bearers, committee members, volunteers, suicide helpline volunteers. There are too many to name here. Some of them are listed in the next few slides in no particular order. This is just for the sake of completion. Squadron leader Nalamathu, he was uh, uh, the able uh, administrator, wing commander, Dr. J.W. Sobani, uh, you know, of the Indian Psychiatric Society, who after retirement from Indore came to live in Bangalore and constantly helped MPA. Susi Joseph was our first psychologist and counselor, Reverend Dr. Casey Joseph, who was a secretary of the Medical Partial Association. Until his death, he came every week 
once for conducting a counseling session for the staff and conducting a group meeting for all the residents. Father Ligauri Mimpin, this is Juliana John, past secretary, Laurene Chako, wife of Air Kamado Chako, Dr. V. Benjamin, retired professor of community medicine from CMC. After retirement, he came to Bangalore, settled down. He used to help us. Reverend Carlos and Saroj Welsh, Mr. K.V. Krishnan, Reverend Jovita D'Souza, Mr. Jacob Martin, Mrs. Martin, Ramola Joseph, Leela Chandi, Mr. J. Alexander, former chief secretary of Karnataka, who passed away two months ago. Dr. This Daddy Sumitra, Captain Akup, Koyla Jani, Mr. Lata Jacob, who worked for 30 years with us as an indifferent capacity. This is only a, a, a listing of some of the names. There are many, many more people. Some of them are also attending this webinar. These are pictures, Captain Squadron Leader Nallamuthu, when he was still in the Air Force, Reverend Dr. J. Casey Joseph, passed away in 1993. This is Reverend E.C. John, who was the principal of the United Theological College and his wife, Juliana, uh, a German national, who was the Secretary of Medical Bachelor Association. Wing Commander Sabani, who many of us here know, he studied with uh, Dr. Kalyan Sandram. He was one year my senior in the man's he helped the Medical Bachelor Association because in his retirement, he lived close to MPA and he would come and help us. Carlos and Saroj. Saroj was our secretary. Ramola Joseph was our secretary. Mr. Martin was the president. Mrs. Martin, who was a long time volunteer. Reverend Jovita Dizosa was vice president. Mr. Alexander was a number of years our treasurer. Benita Dizosa, who gave, uh, you know, a substantial donation for building our uh, uh, residential quarters. Captain Akup Aljani, who was our vice president and who was in charge of the Sahai, he is very proudly standing in front of all the you know news items about Sahai, you know about the success stories uh, of Sahai, etc. And uh, uh, of course, untimely death a couple of years ago. This is uh, our secretary, who uh, you know. Uh, worked very hard to raise the money to buy the land during the period 19, 2004, 2005, 2006, etc. Now I'll conclude by making general comments about the future. This is not really about the future. That was the first NGO in the country. Today, uh, invisible yet widespread, the uh, widespread, the non-profit sector. The current government may not like the non-profit sector very much for a variety of reasons, but they are the ones who are doing a lot of good work. Why? Charismatic leadership, they generate new ideas, creative and innovative programs. They have high motivation, commitment, response to felt needs, quite injustice, modest budgets, flexible, less bureaucratic, but they also criticize uh, altruistic, are they idealistic, independent, they are contractors for government, religious goals? I'm not going to the details. I just wanted to mention that there are lots of numerous uh, NGOs doing various things in the field of mental health. What is the situation about the mental health, the mental hospitals I showed you? Uh, have things changed? Perhaps not very much in many parts of uh, the world. Eastern Europe, there are still old mental hospitals in many parts of Asia, including ours. Uh, Asia, the, I'm just showing some pictures from a 2005 time uh, uh, essay, cover story, Asia's mental health, mental health centers look more like prison than hospitals. This is, I think, in uh, Taiwan, probably, you know. So these are as recent as 10 years ago. Things of, while things, we talk about the institutionalization, et cetera, Certain things have not changed very much. This is from our own country, uh, 2014 or 15. It's a cover story of the English magazine, The Week, Mad, Bad World. Sprayed with insecticide to kill body lice. Many are kept naked, no fans, little food. Anyway, this is much more recent, 2016. Human Rights Watch, account of women in institutions. This is not only mental hospitals, but also institutions for mentally handicapped. So number of residential facilities have steadily increased, diverse models, marked variation in their size, number, process and outcomes in such facilities uh, are highly variable. Uh, I think there is a need to audit some of these because 
you know, are we creating new asylums in the community, virtual asylums in the community? I'll end by making two quotes. Psychiatrics, this is 2015, the late Dr. Chawan wrote in the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. Psychiatric rehabilitation is still in the nascent stage in India and much is required to be done. Let me go, give a much more recent quote. And this is by Dr. Sivakumar. I think I saw him in the audience when we started. He is the head of the psychiatry, the rehabilitation psychiatry in demands now. In India, psychiatric rehabilitation is still in its infancy. So although MPA is uh, celebrating its 50th year, we have lots of things to do in the attempt. What after me, this is something where MPA is always facing. Elderly parents, they have children who have illness, etc. I will end by this. This is the celebration of Republic Day on 26th of January, 2020. The person whose back you see is one of our residents who is hoisting the flag. The other person is our staff. This is uh, with the help of the staff, the residents drew the map of India. Why I'm showing this is because of the next slide. The next day in the newspaper, I read this news in Decanada, Republic Day in the city quite low-key and mostly confined to government institutions because of COVID, because of a number of reasons, but MPA celebrated. I will end by this, and uh, uh, this is uh, when we send the invitation of the 50th anniversary to Dr. Padmavati, who is the current director of STAR. STAR, for those who don't know, was started by Dr. Sharda Menon, who passed away recently. Then Dr. Tara was the director who retired. And now Padmavati is the director. I lend my talk by this. Congratulations to MPA. Half a century in time. Phenomenal perseverance through the years. Stories of recovery to tell. And endless experience in the field. Proud to know Team MPA. Anybody who wants any of more details or any of these pictures, kindly write to me at this mail and I'll be more than happy to say. Thank you very much for a patient listening. I have exceeded my time, but then... You know, this is our golden jubilee. So I thought I must take this uh, uh, privilege of uh, the indulgence of the chair.